Good morning, and for our group, we will be discussing Rizal's annotation of Sucesos de las Islas Filipinas. But first, let us watch this video for you to have an idea about the topic that we will be discussing. I wrote this book to chronicle the deeds achieved by the Spaniards to document the events of this country, the Philippines. Through this, I share my experiences and observations, and of others. May this book be a window to the past for future generations and for them to learn from. Sucesos de las Islas Filipinas. Okay, let's go now with the discussion. The original title of the book is Sucesos de las Islas Filipinas por el Dr. Antonio de Morga, obra publicada en México en el año de 1609, nuevamente sacada a luz y anotada por José Rizal, y precedida de un prólogo del profesor Fernando Blumentritt, or in English, Events in the Philippine Island by Dr. Antonio de Morga, a work published in Mexico in the year 1609, reprinted and annotated by Jose Rizal, preceded by the introduction by Professor Ferdinand Blumentritt. So, let's first have uh, some definition of key terms related to our report. So, first one is the annotation. Annotation is a note of explanation or comment added to a text or diagram. So, isa daw tong note or comment na dinadagdag sa isang text, often scholarly works, to provide uh, explanations or criticisms about, about a particular part of it. But the term is can be used in more general way to refer to a note added in any text. So, a note that you scribble in the margin of your textbooks is an annotation. So, next one is sucesos. Sucesos is an events, happenings, or occurrences. So, it means the work of an honest observer, a versatile bureaucrat who knew the workings in the administration from the inside. And the last one, Las Islas Filipinas. It is simply means the Philippine Island. The Philippines was named in honor of King Philip II of the Spain. So, Ang laman daw ng book na ito is yung mga events na nangyari sa Pilipinas before and during the Spanish colonization na kung saan nagbigay komento si Rizal sa bawat part na nakita niyang may mali at dapat itama. So, ito rin yung isa sa mga achievement ni Rizal sa Paris noong January. 1990 was the publication of his second book. Ito nga yung annotated edition of Morga's Sucesos. So, he discovered, he discovered it in a British library museum copied it verbatim by hand and then annotated so it was printed by printed by Garnier Ferrere so what initially prompted Rizal to do the annotation so there are two uh, Rizal have been reflecting on his country's history and the second one is Blumentritt could not be persuaded to write the history of the Philippines. So, for the first one, Dr. Rizal had been reflecting about our country's past and he had a burning desire to, knew, to know exactly the condition of the Philippines when Spaniards came here because uh, he realized the importance of the past as a tool to understand the present and eventually confront the future. So, despite of this, he restrained himself from embarking some historical research and admitted his inadequacy to do the same. So, makikita to sa letter na ipinadala niya sa isang matalik niyang kaibigan na si Blumentritt niya and instead, uh, he asked his friend to write the history of the Philippines since he knew that Blumentritt is capable of doing it because he already read a lot of book about the Philippines and the 
Spain. However, Blumentritt refused to do so. Instead, he encouraged Rizal more to write the history of his own country by saying na dapat daw ay isang Indio yung gumawa ng anotasyon o yung magsulat tungkol sa history ng bansa nito at hindi isang foreigner. So, by the time Blumentritt refused Rizal, Rizal was already working on the sequel of his novel No Limitang Hire, but Rizal uh, tore up the completed of uh, completed chapters of El Felibusterismo and changed its plot completely and decided to set aside his literary labors and began to work the history of his own country. So, but nga ba pinili ni Rizal yung work ni Morga? But first, let me introduce to you who is Antonio de Morga. So, Antonio de Morga is a Spanish lawyer and officials in the Philippines during the 17th century that was born in 1559 in Seville. He graduated from the University of Salamanca in the year 1574 and attained a doctorate in canon law. He taught briefly on Osuna and later on he returned to Salamanca to study civil law. He also engaged in government service. He was a lieutenant governor in Manila, the second most powerful position in the colony after the governor general of the Philippines. So after he resigned from being a, from being a lieutenant governor, he became a judge in Udencia. He is the author of the annotated book of Rizal Sucesos de las Islas Filipinas. So, uh, his book is one of the most important works in the Philippines about the colonization of the Spain as it explains the political, social, and economical aspects of the colonizers and the colonized country. So, but nga ba nag-end up si Morga na isulat yung libro na to? So, there is a claim daw na sinimula ni Morgan uh, isulat yung libro na to, yung sucesos, as a way to save himself from the disasters with the Dutch invaders in Manila. So, Morga's reputation in the colony sunk like his flagship and eventually transferred to Mexico. So, bakit nga ba pinili ni Rizal yung uh, work ni Morga over the other Spanish accounts and why does he recommend Morga to his countrymen? So, Rizal's choice of re reprinting Morga rather than the other contemporary historical accounts of the Philippines was due to the following Reason. So, the first one is, the original book was rare. Morga's book was rare. The original Spanish textbook of Morga's Sucesos had never been reprinted in full until the annotated edition of Rizal. So, sa introduction ni Rizal, sa kanyang annotation, uh, Blumentritt notes that the book was so rare that the few libraries have a copy guard on it. So, for the second one, Morga was a layman, not a religious Chronicler. So, layman means a person who is not part of the clergy. So, uh, Morga's book uh, was the only civil as opposed to the religious or ecclesiastical history of the Philippines written during the colonial period. So, uh, accounts of those who are non-religious though were rare, making Morga's account only the secular general history of the Philippines in print over the two Century. So, there's a main complaint against religious historians was that uh, they tackle more with church history rather, rather than the history of the Philippines and its people. So, for the third uh, reason, Morga is to be more objective than the other religious writers. He believes that Morga's account was more objective, more trustworthy rather than those written by the religious missionaries. Kasi daw, yung mga rel religious missionaries, their aim was not to record the history as is, but to document the achievements of their religious orders and more importantly, to edify or educate their readers. So, for the fourth reason, Morga was more sympathetic to the Indios. So, Rizal's choice of Morga was that uh, it appeared more sympathetic at least in parts of the Indios. In friar accounts do kasi, many of which were biased or downright racist in tone and interpretation. And for the last reason, Morga was not only an eyewitness but a major actor in the events he narrates. So, Morga was an eyewitness and therefore a primary source on the Philippines and its people at the point of the first contact with Spain. So, now... 
let's talk about uh, let us talk about uh, with the content of the Sucesos de las Islas Filipinas. So, let's first have the introduction of the Sucesos. So, he did that Rizal dedicated this historical work to the Filipinos so that they may know their glorious past. So, Rizal said in his dedication, No Limitang Hira is the sketch of the actual conditions of our country and he seemed to have been reflecting on our country's past or history shortly after completing the said novel in the late February 1887 and obviously drawing on a popular Tagalog proverb ang hindi marunong lumingon sa pinanggalingan ay hindi makakarating sa paroroonan or he who does not know where he came from will never reach his destination also he recognized that he had to reflect on what had taken place during the past three centuries. He said he was born and breed of Libyus of our past, like most of his contemporaries. So uh, he felt that he had no voice or authority to talk on what he did not know. He found it necessary to invoke the testimony of an illustrious Spaniard who ruled the destiny of the Philippines and was witness to the windling of our former identity as he drew on his task of unfolding and rewriting the past. So that illustrious Spaniard earlier was referred to Dr. Antonio de Morga. On the third paragraph of his intro, uh, naging evident yung mga aims niya sa pag-annotate, which are, Una is to prove that Filipinos are civilized even before, even before the coming of the Spaniards. So for the second one, uh, to awaken the consciousness of the Filipinos regarding of the glorious ways of the past. So the third one, to correct what has been distorted about the Philippines due, this, due to the Spanish conquest. At according nga kay Rizal, uh, kung talagang maa-achieve yung aims na yun, ay ibig sabihin, hindi, na, hindi mapupunta or hindi napunta sa wala yung mga paghihirap niya sa pagsulat ng kanyang anotasyon. At this point, talakayin naman natin yung content ng libro ni Morgan na Sucesos de las Islas Filipinas at ang ilan sa mga nilalaman ng chapters 1 to 7 nito at ilan ding annotations ni Dr. Rizal patungkol dito. So the work consists of 8 chapters and those 8 chapters are the following. Of the first discoveries of the Eastern Islands, of the government of Dr. Francisco de Sande, of the government of Don Gonzalo Ranquillo de Peñalosa, of the government of Dr. Santiago de Vera, of the government of Gomez Perez das Marinas, of the government of Don Francisco Tellio, of the government of Don Pedro de Acuna, and an account of the Philippine Islands. So yung unang pitong chapters nito ay naglalaman ng mga kaganapang may kaugnayan sa politika at gobyerno na naganap dito sa Pilipinas sa ilalim ng termino ng unang labing isang gobernador general na naatasang mamahala dito. Magmula kay Miguel Lopez de Legazpi hanggang kay Pedro de Acuña. In chapters 1 to 7, puno siya ng storya tungkol sa intrigang politikal na kinasangkutan ng mga gobernador general. Nakasaad dito na yung mga gobernador general, habang pinamamahalaan yung evangelization o pagkikristyanay sa Pilipinas, ay nilayon ding masako pa mga teritoryo ng Molucas, China, Japan, Cambodia, Siam at Cochin, China. At yung Molucas nga, sa kabila ng pagkakasakop dito ng Portugal, ay nanatili pa rin ng spice trade sa pagitan nito at ng Pilipinas. At yung mga Espanyol na nakabase sa Maynila ay naglalayag papuntang Molucas, hindi lamang para sa spice trade kundi para magkalat din ng intriga o issue sa mga prinsipe doon na lagi namang mayroong away sa pagitan ng isa't isa. With regards evangelization ng Pilipinas, Dr. Rizal on his annotation on this part, sinabi niya na, um, yung pag -e evangelize sa Pilipinas ng mga panahon na yon ay malayo pa sa pagiging kompleto kung kaya't hindi naman talaga kailangan ng mga gobernador general na mag-cross borders. Stated on these chapters too, we're about the nepotism or yung unfair na practice ng mga taong may kapangyarihan o katungkulan na kung saan binibigyan nila ng uh, trabaho o pabor yung mga kamag-anak nila at ito raw ay common o pangkaraniwan sa Pilipinas noon, gayon din ang korupsyon. 
And also, yung mga relihiyoso nung panahon na to ay walang mintes or walang tigil sa pagpapakalat ng pananampalatayang mayroon sila among the infidels. Yung mga infidels, sila yung mga taong hindi naniniwala sa katulad na relihiyon na pinaniniwalaan ng mga relihiyosong nabanggit. At kadalasan daw, yung mga ganitong gawaing sosyopolitikal ay ginagawa without the knowledge of the Spanish monarchs. Sa mga chapters din na to, sa chapters 1 to 7, maraming naisulat si Morga tungkol sa Moro Pirate Raids na naganap sa Visayas at Luzon at gayon din ang mga pagtatangka ng mga Spanish governors na sakupin ang Mindanao, Holo at Sulu. Dr. Rizal noted na dahil yung Spanish colonial administration noon ay hindi pinayagang humawak ng mga armas sa mga natives na nabinyagan na bilang kristyano ay hindi nila nagawang ipagtanggol ang kanilang mga sarili laban sa mga Moro Pirates nga. At sa halip, yung kawalan nila ng armas na yon ay parang naging daan pa para ma-encourage yung pang-atake ng mga Moro. Meanwhile, yung last chapter naman, yung chapter 8, An Account of the Philippine Island, naglalaman siya ng higit na uh, mga personal na observasyon ni Morga tungkol sa Pilipinas at dito nga naging interesado si Dr. Jose Rizal at naging daan para sa kanyang mga annotations na siya nating pagtutuunan sa susunod na parte ng aming report. Yung chapter 8, uh, naglalaman siya ng mga description tungkol sa pre-Hispanic Filipinos or Indios at sa Pilipinas at the time of the Spanish contact. Malaki ang naitulong ng chapter na to kay Dr. Jose Rizal sa pagtukoy sa tunay na kalagayan ng Pilipinas bago pa man dumating ang mga Espanyol at sa pagtatama ng mga maling pananaw tungkol sa mga Pilipino at maling konstruksyon ng kasaysayan ng Pilipinas na nakasaad sa mga Spanish accounts. At gayon din, yung pag sa pag-aanotate niya ng Sucesos de las Islas Filipinas, ninais niyang maipakita sa mga kapwa niya Pilipino ang sibilisasyon at kultura na mayroon sila bago pa man dumating ang mga mananako. At para sa susunod na parte ng aming report, i-discuss at i-compare at contrast ng mga kagrupo ko yung views ni Dr. Rizal at Morga tungkol sa mga Pilipino, sa Pilipinas at sa kulturang mayroon dito noon. Si Francis ang magre-representa kay Morga at si Darlene naman ang magre-representa kay Dr. Rizal. Morga's versus Rizal's view about the Pilipinas, the Philippines and its culture. So let us start to compare and contrast Morga's and Rizal's view in indigenous people in the Philippines. According to Morga, those natives living in Luzon are tribes whom one cannot deceive with because to pacify them, it is either through good or violent means. According to Dr. Rizal, they will always choose violence until the government enters because of their inhumane ways as answers to those who do not submit to the priors. Morgan's statement implies that natives of Luzon had that violent tendency, while Dr. Rizal's statement shows that violence among those natives was because of the entry of inhumane and unjust priors. So next is body tattoo. Morga described the process of having a body tattoo by stating that inhabitant natives, also known as Visaya, draw pattern first before putting black powder where the blood oozes. Torisal agreed to Morga saying it is the same method used by the Japanese. Next is clothing. Sa paglalarawan ni Morga, ang mga Pilipino noon ay may dalawang uri ng kasuotan. Ang una ay ang bagay na nakasuot sa gitna ng kanilang mga bewang at ito ay tinatawag na bahak. Ang pangalawa naman ay ang bagay na nakabalot sa kanilang mga ulo na tinatawag naman na potong. Dr. Rizal corrected the error of Morga. He noted that bahag is a rich colored cloth and quite often with gold strips and they put more style like a turban. So mali po yung term ni Morgan na bahak para sa bahag. In terms of food, Morga said that Filipinos eat beef and fish which they know is best when it has started to rot and stink. Dr. Rizal was disgusted when he read about that in Morga's successos, in his annotation, he went to say that Spaniards, like any other people, treat food which they are not accustomed to with disgust. 
i-clarified na yung isda that Morgan mentioned ay hindi pa masarap o gawa hanggang sa ito ay magsimula ng mabulo. Ang tinutukoy po dito ay yung bagoong at sa mga nakakain na nakalasa na nito ay alam na po na hindi ito dapat bulok o rotten. So next is drinking. Morgan said that natives drink heavily. They ended up drunk during wedding feast. The reason why he state that is because in gatherings, natives used to eat and drink the whole day until sunset. In his annotation, Rizal quoted from Father Colin who said, It is common knowledge that they drink a lot, but no matter how inebriated they seem to be after a gathering or a feast, they can always find their way home. Government According to Morga, there were no kings and queens or lords in different barrios or provinces to rule. Instead, they considered principles among the natives, and these principles were looked up to, respected, and obeyed by their constituents. Morga continued saying that individuals or families belonging to the principles form relationships and friendship with each other and sometimes due to differences, cause wars. Dr. Rizal emphasized that friendly relations were more common as opposed to wars. So let us move forward to marriage, family, and household. Morga said that the groom was the only one who contributes a dowry, which he inherits or receives from his parents. He also stated that the bride contributes nothing until she inherits from her parents. Sabi naman po ni Dr. Rizal, katuwang ng lalaki ang kanyang asawa at hindi nakikita bilang pabigat. Somehow po, taliwas ito sa parang ibi-ipakulugan ni Morgan na yung lalaki daw po o yung husband lang ang may ambag. Morgan used the term bahandin to identify the house where the parents and children live. Dr. Rizal corrected the term bahandin, stating that in Tagalog, a house is called pamamahay. It is impossible that bahandin is printed for bahayin. According to Morga, a wife married to a native man is called inasawa. Dr. Rizal once again corrected the term used. It was not inasawa but rather asawa. So next is religion and our healers. Morga said that before, there were no priest or a man of religion to attend to religious matters. Instead, they believe in idols and superstition which the devil inspired them to do and to tell whether a sick person would live or die. As for Dr. Rizal, there are actually priests called Catalona or Babaylan. However, they were not glorified as they were believed to be loafers. Belief on Crocodiles Morga said that the natives revere and venerate the crocodiles because they are afraid of its power. Even Christian curse made the crocodile kill him to those people who make false promises, prejure, and breach contracts. May they suffer the wrath of the buhaya. Rizal explained that there were instances when crocodiles, while sparring their Indian servants, gobbled priors. Dahil nga po sa paniniwala nilang galit din sila sa mga prile, kaya parang galit din yung mga crocodile sa mga prile. Customs for the dead According to Morga, natives bury the dead in their houses. In their funeral, there was no procession, only those performed by the members of the households of the dead. So ang tang seremonya lamang sa paglilibing ay kung ano lang gagawin ng mga kamag-anak ng namatay. And as per Dr. Rizal's comment, Mas okay yung ganong practice. Like he said, it is much more natural to venerate the remains of our loved ones than those fanatical martyrs whom we have no dealings and who probably will never remember us. So let us now talk about trade and economy. First is cotton. According to Morga's view, cotton is raised in the island and they spin it to thread and sell it. Dr. Jose Rizal agreed. Using the same material, which was cotton, they weave blanket and garment, which they also sell. But according to Dr. Rizal, 
Morga must have been meant Sinamay, which was woven from abaca. Next is artifact. The natives of the island sells the artifact to the Japanese. Morga added that these basins become very scarce, which lead to high demand on them. Torisal once agreed. And lastly, gold. Igorots kept their gold buried in the ground because they felt that the gold were more secured there than in their houses or settlement. Torisal agreed once again, saying that the Igorots are right for doing so. So next is artillery. Governor Sanchago de Vera, on his time, had set up a pandry for the making of artillery under the hands of an old Indio called Pandapira. Si Pandapira o Pandaypira ay isang native ng Pampanga na inatasan nga ni Governor de Vera para magproduce ng artilleries. If you will search what does artillery means and relate the result to this context, Artillery or artilleries mean large guns. But ang sabi po ni Dr. Rizal was that Panday Pira was an Indio who already knew how to found panels even before the arrival of the Spaniards. While he supported the claim of Morga about artillery in the Philippines, we can see here that their claims quite deviated from each other. Cannons are very different from large guns. Alam naman po natin yung itsura ng kanyon as compared to artilleries or large guns na nakikita po natin. So next is shipbuilding industry. Morga was amazed at the native skill for boat making and navigating without a compass. Quite amazed, Morga described Filipino boats large enough to carry 100 rowers on the border, which is also called Evanda, and 30 soldiers on top, which is also called Pelea. So in total, 130 people can be carried by a single boat made by the Indios back then. Rizal expounded on that by saying that Filipinos, like the inhabitants of the Marianas, were known for their shipbuilding and navigational skills. But unfortunately, there was no progress because the natives were obliged to make European-style boats like the galleons. Dr. Rizal, as the latter noted, that the country at one time with primitive means build ships of around 2,000 tons. The ships, if compared to those like written in Morgas accounts, are much bigger. Moreover, on his annotation, he went on by lamenting the environmental costs of Spanish boat building, saying that it did not only kill the pre-Hispanic boat building industry among the angels, but also killed a lot of trees with no thought of, of conservation. System of writing and accompanying literature. Morga observed that writing was widely in use all over the pre Hispanic Philippines, that all Indians, men as well as women, could read and write at least properly in their own language. And Dr. Rizal agreed that there was indeed a system of writing but went one step farther in assuming that there was a great volume of written literature of the time the Spaniards arrived in the Philippines. So in Morgas, there is a system of writing, but in Dr. Rizal's, the system of writing is accompanied by written literature. As you guys have noticed from what we compared and contrasted, Dr. Rizal's annotation fall into two categories. First, are the straightforward annotation where Rizal amplified or corrected the original. Second, are the annotation which, though historically based, reflected his strong anti-clerical bias or his being against the influence or interference in secular affairs of the clergy, consisted of priests or friars. And the latter category of Dr. Rizal's annotation was one of the criticism thrown at him when he wrote the annotation. This criticism came not from an enemy, but from his friend whom he first asked to write about the history of the Philippines, Professor Blumentry. The first to be criticized by the professor was Dr. Rizal's use of hindsight or the knowledge and understanding of an event after it occurred. The second, as mentioned, was his strong anti-clerical bias. 
another one who was criticized who has criticized Dr. Rizal in his annotation was a fellow patriot in the person of Isabella de los Reyes. According to him, the discrepancy between the accounts of Morga and Dr. Rizal can be explained by Dr. Rizal's excessive patriotism. However, despite this criticism, this literary work of Dr. Rizal, just like his other novels, and though not as popular and as distributed as the former, has its own contribu contributions and the establishment of a national consciousness and identity and to the history of the Philippines and the fact that it was, if not the earliest, one of the earliest written account about the Philippine history coming from the point of view of an Indio, the one who was colonized and not from the perspective of the colonizer. In conclusion, kung ang nolimit ang hire ay tungkol sa kasalukuyan at ang el filibusterismo naman ay tungkol sa hinaharap, ang anotasyon ni Dr. Rizal sa Sucesos de las Islas Filipinas ni Morga ay tungkol naman sa nakaraan. Inialay niya ito sa mga kapwa niya Pilipino at naglalayong gisingin ng kanilang mga diwa tungkol sa mayaman nilang nakaraan. Patunay ay ang pagiging sibilisado na ng mga Pilipino noon pa man at upang maitama ang mga maling pagtingin sa mga Pilipino at maging sa Pilipinas. Sa pumagitan nito, inaasahang mabubuo ang isang diwa at identidad ng mga bansa. Lahat tayo ay pamilyar sa kasabihang mula rin sa ating pambansang bayaning si Dr. Cerizal, na ang hindi marunong lumingon sa pinanggalingan ay hindi makararating sa paroroonan. At kung iuugnay natin ito sa kanyang mga gawa o akda, ang anotasyon niya ng libro ni Morga, ang pinanggalingang dapat lingunin hindi lamang nila noon, kundi pati na rin natin maging sa kasalukuyan. At bilang panghuling parte ng report namin, since under siya ng methodology, though just slightly related to the main focus of our report, which is yung annotation nga ni Dr. Jose Rizal sa libro ni Morga na Sucesos de las Islas Filipinas, may narapat pa rin namin isama ang tripartite view of Philippine history. At ito nga siya, a legacy of the propaganda, the tripartite view of the Philippine history. Yung history ng Pilipinas, just like most national histories, ay maaaring hatiin sa tatlong division. At iyon nga yung pre-colonial, colonial, at post-colonial. At kaya ng nakasaad sa slide, elaborated during the propaganda movement, it became the historical worldview of the revolution, which was considered to be the final struggle to bring about the period of freedom from colonial bondage. Ngunit bago magkaroon ng uh, tripartite view of Philippine history, mayroon munang Spain's bipartite view of Philippine history. So, nakapaloob sa bipartite view ng um, Spain ay dalawang epochs. Yung first epoch, it refers to the barbarian and pagan condition of the Filipinos in the pre-Hispanic past. So, sa pananaw ng Spain, yung mga ninuno natin noon na dinatnan nila dito ay mas mabababang uri kaysa sa kanila at um, kakaunti or wala sila totaling mga relihiyon. At yung second epoch naman was about the advent of Spain and its civilizing influences in terms of polity and religion. The image that one often gets from chronicles to illustrate this historical view is that of transition from darkness to light or from infancy to progressive maturity. So, pananaw na Spain, parang ang dating ay um, naging saving glory yung pananakop nila dito ng mga ninuno natin. At kung mapapansin nga natin, yung first epoch, it refers to the... Um, uh, pre-colonial division of history at yung second epoch naman it refers to the colonial division of history. So, sa view ng Spain walang uh, post-colonial division of history. Ngunit sa pag-usbong ng mga kabataan ng ikalawang um, bahagi ng ikalabing siyam na siglo na siyang mga edukado at hindi makakapayag sa klase ng buhay at pagtratong ibinibigay sa kapwa nila mga Pilipino umusbong na nga ang tripartite View of Philippine History Nabanggit kanina na na-elaborate ito during the propaganda movement kung kaya tatalakayin natin ang tatlong ilustradong propagandista at ang kanika nilang tripartite view ng kasaysayan ng 
Pilipinas. Ngunit bago yun, ano nga ba ang tripartite view? So, ang tripartite view ay naglalaman ng revision ng dalawang epochs na nakapaloob sa uh, bipartite view ng Spain at ang karagdagang isa pang epoch na tutukoy na sa post-colonial division of history. So, nakikita natin ngayon sa screen ay ang summary ng tripartite view ng tatlong, prop, uh, tatlong ilustradong propagandista na si Marcelo H. Del Pilar, Graciano Lopez Saena, at Dr. Jose Rizal. Una ay si Marcelo H. Del Pilar. Sa pre-colonial, tinanggap niya yung pagtingin ng Spain na mayroong inferior civilization ng Pilipinas ang nagkaroon ng blood compact sa pagitan ng um, dalawang bansa na kung saan tatayo bilang ina sa pagsisibilisa at pagkikristyanize ang Spanya sa anak nitong Pilipinas. Sa kolonyal naman, yung civilizing mission ng Spain sa Pilipinas ay unang iniyatang sa mga encomenderos na kalaunan ay napasakamay ng mga praile na noong una ay responsable sa iniyatang sa kanilang tungkulin ngunit kalaunan ay um, hinangad o inuna yung, pang, uh, pang, yung pangsarili nilang interest at naghangad ng kapangyarihan. At noong, na, noong nakamit na nga nila yung kapangyarihan, ay inestablish nila yung frailocracia o yung gobyerno ng mga praile na siyang naging dahilan ng pagbagal ng progreso dito sa Pilipinas. Sa post-colonial, dapat umales ang mga praile. Ang kalayaan ng Pilipinas ay matatamo sa pamamagitan ng revolusyon na inihalin tulad niya sa isang surgery o operasyon na kung saan Uh, mas mabilis na proseso ito kaysa sa proseso ng pagtatapa lamang ng mga bandages. Ngunit sa pananaw niya rin, mas mainam pa rin ang liberal na reforma. At ayon sa isang author o historia na kinot sa source na ginamit namin, hanggang sa dulo naging totoo si Del Pilar sa programa ng asimilasyon at iyon nga yung integrasyon ng Pilipinas sa mas malawak na nasyon ng Espanya. Sunod ay si Graciano Lopez sa ENA at kaya nang nakasaad dito sa pre-colonial, nagkaroon siya ng ambivalent or contradictory view ng um, pre-colonial Philippines. One moment, naisip niya, naisip niya na yung Pilipinas ay nasa primitive state pa at in the next, naisip naman niyang mayroon na itong civilization or degree of um, enlightenment. Sa colonial, kagaya ni Del Pilar ay... Um, Bumagal ang progreso dito sa bansa dahil sa mga praile, gawa ng kanilang monastic supremacy at yung progress na natamo ng mga Pilipino noon ay dahil lamang sa mga sarili nila at sa external forces kagaya ng pagbubukas ng Pilipinas sa foreign trade at hindi dahil sa pamumuno ng mga Espanyol. At sa post-colonial, kagaya ulit ni Del Pilar ay dapat umalis sa mga praile para mawala sa kanila ang pamumuno. Noong una ay naniniwala rin siya sa programa ng asimilasyon, ngunit kalaunan ay mas pinaburan niya ang revolusyon. At gaya din nakasaad dito, sa pananaw ni Graciano Lopez sa ENA, Freedom won with the blood of the Filipinos. At panghuli ay si Dr. Jose Rizal. So yung um, view niya or pananaw niya sa pre-colonial Division of History ng Philippines ay naiiba sa pananaw ni Del Pilar at Graciano Lopez Saena dahil para sa kanya, ay dahil para kay Dr. Jose Rizal, ay mayroon ng sibilisasyon ang Pilipinas noon at may progreso, kaakibat or kaagapay ng sarili nitong mga kakayahan at kapasidad at mga virtues. So, gaya ng natalakay kanina sa, rep sa unang bahagi ng report, pinatunayan ni Dr. Jose Rizal yung sibilisasyon na to at yung kulturang nag exist na sa Pilipinas bago pa man dumating yung mga Espanyol sa pamamagitan ng annotations niya sa um, libro ni Morgan na Sucesos de las Islas, Pilipinas. Sa kolonyal naman, nagkaroon ng decay o pagkamatay at retrogression o backwardness in relation sa kultura natin dati Magmula nang namuno dito ang mga Espanyol. Yung mga civic virtues na dati nang nag -e exist ay nawala at napalitan nito ng mga bisyo. Ang bisyong nabanggit nga ni Dr. Jose Rizal ay ang bisyo ng pagsusugal o gambling na ayon sa kanya ay imbis na gawing karapat dapat ang mga Pilipino sa kalayaan ay ginagawa lamang na karapat dapat ang mga Pilipino sa pang-aalipin. At gayon din, nabanggit niya ang pagkakaroon ng kanser ng lipunan na, siya, na marihin niya rin namang ipinahayag at tinuligsa sa nobela niyang Noli Metangere. 
At sa post-colonial naman, there would be the release of the creative forces of the race with the attainment of freedom na alam naman nating nangyari talaga sa pamamagitan ng mga kabataan sa henerasyon nila na ginamit ang talino at talento para sa kapakanan ng Pilipinas. At sa pananaw ni Dr. Jose Rizal, ang kalayaan ay matatamo tactically through reforms, uh, ngunit kung hindi pa rin gaganda o mababago ang sitwasyon sa pamamagitan ng paghihingi ng reforma, ay maaaring matamo ang kalayaan sa pamamagitan ng revolusyon. So, yon ang tripartite view of Philippine history. At dito na nagtatapos ang aming report. Salamat po!